Okay, we're back at it again, this time with the FATE exam, Focused Assessed Thoracic Echo. And uh, this is a good way to approach the heart, and basically looking at the, uh, the major windows for the heart. A couple of new ones for you guys, and um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and jump right into it. The objectives here are going to be to find the FATE exam views, and also how we use this uh, FATE exam into our critical uh, decision-making processes in patients who are pretty sick. So the original article this FATE exam stemmed from is actually um, was published in the European Journal of Anesthesiology uh, almost, uh, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, and it was called Transthoracic Echocardiography for Cardiopulmonary Monitoring Intensive Care. And uh, that uh, they did a study looking uh, at, after getting these windows of the heart, you know, how much does this really impact uh, patient care? And how hard is it to get these windows? And um, these are for non-cardiologists like um, intensivists doing this. And so uh, it turned out that 97% um, of the time there were usable images that positively contributed to evaluation in patients. Uh, that more than 37% of the time there was new information, stuff that they hadn't even considered that came up in the course of doing the echo. And in more than 24% of the time, the imaging was decisive in the evaluation of their patient. And so this is, I think, a pretty useful uh, test to use on your patients. Now, the goals of the FATE are, number one, to exclude something really obvious, obvious pathology. Uh, number two is to assess the wall thickness and the chamber dimensions. Number three is to assess contractility of the heart. Number four, to image the pleura bilaterally. And finally, relate these findings to the clinical context of the patient. And that's something that you're going to be working on for the rest of your careers, really, is how you integrate all this stuff into a clinical picture. But since um, we're trying to focus more on the pathology this year, this is stuff I thought would be uh, time to finally introduce. So the propositions, now some of these are going to be reviewed for you, but it's, uh, I'll just quickly go through these. Um, one is at the sub xiphoid location, another one is at the apex of the heart, and then another one is over the great vessels of the heart uh, going across um, the uh, mid position of the heart. And then we look at the pleura um, bilaterally as well. And when we look at the subcostal view of the heart, we know we've got the indicator aimed at the patient's right, and we're using the liver as a window to look up and see the four-chambered view of the heart. And it's helpful to put your hand over the transducer in an overhand grip pattern, allowing the cable to exit the bottom of your hand. And then you have to push down so much with the probe, um, you're kind of flattening out the probe. It's sort of parallel to the bed as opposed to the other windows that we get where we're looking down into the chest or down into the body. This one is pretty much parallel with the, with the patient's body axis, which is why the cable should exit the bottom of our hand. Now again, I mentioned we use the liver as the window to see the heart. So patients with a small liver, this is a very difficult, if not impossible, view to get. But we can see here on this patient, uh, there's the right side of the heart, and the left side of the heart, the right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium, and uh, left atrium. Here's another view here of another subcostal, uh, four-chambered view of the heart. We can see the, uh, the interventricular septum right along here. And again, we've got the indicator towards the patient's right, and we're just looking at the heart as it beats, and the four-chambered view using the liver as our window to see the heart. Again, the right ventricle is seen anteriorly with the right atrium. The blood flows through the tricuspid valve when it goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And then we're looking uh, posteriorly as well at the left ventricle and the left atrium. Four-chambered subcostal view, blood going through the mitral valve. You can also see the pericardium pretty easily as well on that uh, subcostal view. And when we're in that subcostal location, it's easy to then rotate the transducer um, with the indicator going towards the patient's head or at 12 o'clock and then we're going to take it from that longitudinal axis we're just going to go parasagittal to the right. What does that mean? Well sagittal means right up and down the center of the body. Parasagittal, you could be parasagittal left or right. Parasagittal left would be more towards the aorta. Parasagittal right gives us the inferior vena cava. And when we look at that inferior vena cava we can see that uh, inferior vena cava drain into the right atrium of um, of the heart, and uh, that should say right atrium, it says RV, but it should say RA, 
and um, we can see that it's going right underneath the liver and the hepatic vein is dumping into the IVC approximately right here and the location at which we want to assess the IVC is back here and by assessment I mean we're gonna see how much it collapses and depending on how much it collapses during inspiration is how hydrated or dehydrated the patient is so for example if the IVC diameter is small less than 1.7 centimeters and there's more than a 50 percent collapse upon inspiration then the CVP or central venous pressure or how hydrated the patient is is said to be very low 0 to 5 and as the uh, IVC if it's greater than 1.7 and we still have uh, but we still have more than 50 percent collapse uh, in this case the CVP is higher 5 to 10 and then if we have less than 50 percent collapse the CVP is even higher 10 to 15 and then when we have more than 1.7 centimeters and there's very minimal collapse upon inspiration the CVP is said to be 15 to 20 and then finally if it's more than two centimeters and you can even now see the hepatic veins that are dilated this is a very plethoric or full IVC um, obviously it's not going to collapse much on inspiration and then the CVP is said to be very high greater than 20 and even in these patients who have high CVPs can actually be quite hypotensive uh, and in the setting of hypotension, it's um, a reflex many times to just give more fluids. But you could say in this case, there's another cause for the hypotension in this case, not um, dehydration that would cause uh, or um, hypovolemia that would cause the, um, the hypotension. And so this is where this IVC assessment can, can become very important in the setting of resuscitation. So here we are, uh, is what it looks like. We're looking uh, subcostally. We're looking uh, through the liver. We have a um, parasagittal right plane. And as the patient breathes in and out, um, we see very little change, uh, if any, in this uh, IVC diameter. And actually, the IVC, these are one centimeter hash marks over here, and the IVC is greater than uh, two centimeters. In this case, the fluid stats would, would be uh, quite high, you know, CVP greater than 20. 15 to 20 since the hepatic veins in that situation were normal one more time the slide got duplicated <laughs> now we're in the apical 4 chamber view we move the probe uh, in that apical 4 chamber which I know you're uh, comfortable with uh, we got the indicator to the patient's right and we're just shining the sound directly towards the spine up into the chest and um, the pair the the position of the patient is on their left side. The patient's kind of uh, rolled uh, decubitus is what we call it. You could take a pillow and uh, shove it under the right shoulder of the patient causing them to roll off to their left a little bit. And if their right arm is uh, in the up position, this makes this view easier to get as well. And it's just basically that four chambered view that uh, we're very comfortable with that we've been studying for a little over a year now. This is what it looks like uh, when we get it just right. We have a nice uh, left ventricle here and we see the left atrium down here on this apical four chamber. It's a nice way to assess the chamber, compare the chambers to one another. We can see that the, uh, the RV is about two-thirds the size of the LV in the normal patient, and we can uh, see the valves quite well in this apical four chambered view. And uh, another reason this is a good view is because of the angle. If we used color flow Doppler, the angle would be much more parallel with the flow of blood rather than perpendicular to it, which is which is much better for whenever we work with Doppler. We want to be parallel, not perpendicular. I'll explain that more later. Now here's a new view for you. This is called the apical two-chambered view, and it's just a, a way to look only at the um, at the left ventricle and the left atrium. And uh, what we do is we rotate the transducer um, 90 degrees counterclockwise, or basically taking that indicator from the patient's right and rotate the transducer so that the indicators aim towards the floor and what this is going to do is give us the left ventricle and the left atrium and we can see now the uh, the different walls of the heart so if we wanted to look at the heart and to see how well it's squeezing nice symmetrical squeeze of the left ventricle if we want to look at the left ventricle and compare the anterior wall and the inferior LV wall and just to see how well they squeeze together to make sure that they have the same amount of squeeze, if you will, this would be um, a nice place to do this. We can also see the left atrium and the left atrial appendage is another thing that we can see on this uh, apical uh, two-chambered view. So if you just wanted to focus on the left atrium, left ventricle, 
this would be the the view to get. And um, and I know that that's a new view we didn't talk about last year, but it, it's one that comes up more and more when you're looking at contractility. So if somebody had a heart attack and they had um, part of their heart was no longer beating as well. We may see um, some dyskinesis in one part of the wall or a stiff wall while over here it's contracting well we may see one segment of the wall that's not contracting well and so that's one of the tip-offs that this patient could be having or has had a heart attack now on the parasternal long axis uh, we know this one quite well we aim the indicator towards the patient's left elbow I realize this is review here no problem this is kind of a cool CT scan uh, that I found uh, related to this parasternal long axis where you can um, see the location of how the heart is right behind the sternum. Here's the sternum, and then we would just place the transducer right here, parasternal, as the name suggests, next to the sternum. Right here, you're going to see the right ventricle at the top of your screen, and then the left ventricle. We can see the left atrium, the aortic outflow tract. Many times we can see the descending aorta as well, and this is the left pleural space seen over here. This is, again, a CT scan, not an ultrasound but a CT basically demonstrating the same plane that we see on a parasternal long axis on an ultrasound. So you can see why we can see pleural effusions uh, back here um, as well on this view. Just a schematic diagram demonstrating the parasternal long axis with the left atrium, the left ventricle, the aortic outflow tract. This location here is where the right ventricle is. Again, parasternal long, we can see that mitral valve nicely coming up and smacking that septum, and that interventricular septum posterior wall squeezed together. The right ventricles at the top of the screen here, right up next to the transducer like it was on that CT scan. Descending aorta. Now here's an example of uh, parasternal long axis, but this one is uh, not normal for several reasons. Um, first of all, there's severely reduced contractility. We can see that the mitral valve is not smacking the septum, and the interventricular septum posterior wall are not squeezing together. There's a few other findings, though. Um, number one is that there's a pericardial effusion. We can see it right in here. It lies anterior to the descending aorta. And as well, there's a pleural effusion seen back here that lies posterior to the descending aorta. And so just keep that in mind. Sometimes you'll be able to see fluid collections back here. And depending on how they layer out with reference to the descending aorta, they may be either pericardial or pleural. You see back here, this that pleural effusion. And right there is that pericardial effusion. So what do you think here? Is this a pericardial or a pleural effusion? Good. Pericardial effusion because the fluid layers itself anterior to the descending aorta. Excellent. So this is a parasternal long axis with a pericardial effusion. Another question, is this normal contractility or decreased LV function? I think you all know well now that because this mitral valve is not coming up towards that septum and the interventricular septum posterior wall are not squeezing together, this clearly, the answer is B, decreased LV function. Now the parasternal short axis, I didn't really talk too much about this uh, in the past, but um, it's from the parasternal long, all you do is rotate the transducer 90 degrees clockwise so that the transducer indicator is aimed to the patient's right elbow. And we see three levels of the um, heart in the parasternal long axis. We can see uh, distally, when we're aiming down towards the apex of the heart, we can see these papillary muscles here. We can see these papillary muscles, and this is down towards the apex. And then I also like to think about um, right in the center of the probe is like the middle of the donut, and then the donut is squeezing all the way around. This nice, normal, contractile, parasternal short axis, all squeezing concentrically together towards the middle. And if we go up from there a little bit more uh, towards the head, more superiorly, if, and we're not even sliding the transducer, we're just angling it. We're just angling it slightly a few millimeters towards the head and then we can get away from the papillary muscles and we can see the mitral valve here. This is all the mitral valve and some people call this the fish mouth view. And then finally if we go up even more superiorly we can see the aortic valve here. This is the aortic valve. We can see the three cusps of the aortic valve there. Okay, And this is actually not well seen on the other images uh, very well but this is definitely the right uh, 
ventricle over here, and in fact, the right ventricular outflow tract comes down right next to the uh, aortic valve. This is the RVOT, or right ventricular outflow tract, and on some patients, if you get this just right, you can see the, the right and left uh, pulmonary arteries bifurcate right here, uh, right in this side wall right here next to the uh, aortic valve. So again, papillary muscles, the mitral valve location, and then the aortic valve location. Just to point out the areas again, this is the area of the papillary muscles there. And we can see just a little piece of the right ventricle on the outside of that. Okay, now we're moving on to the pleura. And the um, the pleural view is uh, on the place the transducers, uh, the transducer on the side of the chest, aiming the indicator towards the patient's head. And as we do this, we'll be able to see the, um, the, the diaphragms on each side. And it's where that diaphragm is that we're looking uh, that divides the chest from the abdomen. Each diaphragm divides the chest from the abdomen. And what we're looking for is any fluid that's on top of the diaphragm or in the chest. And so what we're going to do is take the transducer from the side of the body and aim the indicator towards the patient's head. And the wedge of sound comes in between the ribs. And we can see how the diaphragm divides the chest from the abdomen. And we're looking between the ribs uh, at, along this diaphragm to look for any fluid up in the chest. And as we do so, this is what it looks like. Okay, so this patient's got a pleural effusion on the left side. This happens to be the spleen. Okay, and then just above the diaphragm, this is the diaphragm here, we can see part of the lung that's atelectatic and compressed by all the fluid. Normally we don't see lung because there's air in it, but when it's compressed by that fluid, then we can see it quite well. And there's all the fluid, the pleural effusion there. So we've got the indicator towards the patient's head, and we can make out this fluid that's here up in the chest surrounding the lung. This is a trauma patient. In fact, these are both trauma patients. Um, they're both hit by cars. One of them has a hemothorax and one doesn't. By hemothorax, I mean blood in the chest. And so what we see is the mirror image of the liver up in the chest as it's reflected off the diaphragm. That's normal. That's what we expect to see on patients. And that's the mirror image artifact. It's a very powerful artifact because it tells us there's no fluid, blood or, or fluid in the chest. But when we lose that mirror image artifact, then we see all this fluid up here in the chest. That's what a, a hemothorax or pleural effusion would look like. It's the absence of the mirror image artifact. So getting back to the goals of the fate exam, now that we know where the windows are, uh, number one is to exclude something really obvious like uh, effusions, either around the heart or in the chest, or a really obvious uh, problem with the valves, valvular disease. And then also uh, an aortic uh, dissection can be seen. And also pulmonary embolism is is denoted by having a very large right ventricle. Normally the RV is two-thirds the size of the LV, but when there's a blood clot in the pulmonary artery and you get right ventricular strain, the right ventricle is getting bigger and bigger and bigger trying to pump against a blood clot, the RV starts to approximate the same diameter as the LV. So this was a patient that, was, that came to the emergency department with abdominal pain. A fourth-year medical student scanned the patient um, in the emergency department looking at the gallbladder. This is the gallbladder up here. There's a little bit of a reverberation artifact going on here. Uh, the patient had a language barrier, so we couldn't really understand what he was talking about, but something about you know epigastric pain is what we thought he was saying. Uh, and so we were looking at the student was in there by himself looking at the gallbladder. Now I'm going to let the clip play and see if you see any other pathology here. My eyes kind of drawn over here, and so was the students. He saw this. He saw this black area down here where the heart is. He saw the heart moving, and so then he moved the probe into a more of a subcostal plane. This is the liver. He's getting a subcostal view, and this is what a pericardial effusion looks like—a very large pericardial effusion. In fact, if you want to communicate this pericardial effusion to somebody else and say, "Hey, I've got a pericardial effusion here. I'm pretty worried about," it might even be pericardial tamponade. Pericardial tamponade is a condition in which the pericardial effusion gets so big that the RV can no longer fill during diastole and you have 
a paradoxical situation in which the RV is collapsing instead of filling during diastole. It's called paradoxical RV collapse. But another way to communicate that to somebody quickly is to say that you've got a, you know, one, two, maybe even three centimeter pericardial stripe of fluid in the pericardium. Three centimeters of pericardial fluid will get anybody's attention. And so um, whether or not you see the sonographic findings of tamponade, that's a little tricky to pull up. You can definitely say that this person's got um, a very large pericardial effusion. And um, in the subcostal view, it's hard to tell if you have diastolic collapse of the RV. It's better to look in another view like the apical four chamber view where you can see both the LV and the RV lining up together. But regardless, the student alerted everybody to his findings and the patient immediately went to cardiology for a pericardiocentesis, an emergent pericardiocentesis. Um, and had we not uh, gotten that piece of information, um, this unexpected piece of information, um, it would have been possible to say to the patient, well, you don't have any problems with your abdomen. You know, we did some tests. looks like you're ready to go home. So this is the kind of thing where ultrasound can really help out in these situations. So exclude obvious pathology. Um, another uh, example of obvious pathology would be uh, a problem with, the, in this case, the mitral valve. Um, think about the color flow Doppler here. Red is towards the probe. Blue is away from the probe. Uh, BART, blue away, red towards. And uh, during systole, we shouldn't see any blue going away from um, the left ventricle and into the uh, left atrium. But instead, in this case, we do. We see a blue jet going away from the LV into the LA during systole. It hits the back wall of the atrium. And there's different gradings of um, tricuspid mitral valve regurgitation. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, this is a very obvious, uh, this would be like a 4 plus um, mitral valve regurgitation here with this jet of blue uh, going uh, with each beat of systole into the back wall of the left atrium. You shouldn't see any there. Normal individuals, you won't see any of that. So this is just a case of mitral, uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Another example over here, this one's a little bit cleaner, um, still demonstrating the same concept, this blue jet that's hitting the back wall of that left atrium. This is the apical four chamber view, and I mentioned that the apical four chamber view is a much better view to use color flow Doppler rather than the parasternal long. Now, number two goal of fate is to evaluate the wall thickness and the chamber dimensions. Um, the wall thickness for hypertrophy and the chambers for dilatation. Sometimes you can see aneurysms, um, an aneurysmal part of uh, either ventricle, and um, and you want to make sure you, again you look at the relative size of the RV. The RV should be two thirds the size of the LV. And so as we do this, uh, we, we look at this heart here, and um, what do you think about this heart here? We're looking at the overall uh, chamber um, dimensions and the wall thickness. And so this is the um, interventricular septum here. This is the posterior wall of the heart. And they're quite easy to see. They look, uh, they, just looking off the, just right off the bat here, this um, septum looks, looks pretty thick. It should be uh, less than 1.2 centimeters. Now these are one centimeter hash marks over here. I could tell already this is more than two centimeters uh, just by glancing at it. So the interventricular septum should be less than 1.2, and it's uh, over here seen almost uh, two centimeters. So that's a that's a problem right off the bat. And the uh, the RV should be smaller than the than the LV, and in this case I think that's probably the case. Although the apical four chambered view is a better view to assess the chamber dimensions, as I'll show you here. And in this case, this is the uh, LV. It's much larger than the uh, than the RV. Uh, some would say this LV looks, in fact, it's somewhat dilated, and um, and maybe that's true, but definitely it's uh, larger than the RV, and that's the uh, that's the dimension that we like to see that it's bigger than the um, that it's bigger than the RV. That's good. And then um, just another example here of uh, of another heart that the uh, the LV is larger than the uh, than the RV. Um, no problem there. The apical four chamber view. That's why that window is so important to obtain. In this case. Um, it almost looks like the heart's upside down. And this is a good example here of uh, pathology seen um, quite uh, quite obviously. If we got a chest x-ray of this patient, they would have a very large heart on the chest x-ray. But why is their heart large? What part of their heart is large? Uh, is it the ventricles? No, the ventricles look like uh, they're the normal size. If anything, they look kind of small. It's the atria. Look how big this left atrium is. And the right atrium is very large too. So this patient has 
right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement, severe left atrial enlargement seen here. And, uh, and again, this four-chambered view gives you a good overview of an ability to compare all these chamber sizes with one another. And uh, should you've gotten a chest x-ray on this patient, this is what I don't like about chest x-rays, many things I don't like about x-rays, this is one, we just see a big, large, you know, boot heart, very large heart. This may not look like it's abnormal to you just yet, but trust me, over time you'll see that this is a very abnormally shaped, very large heart. And the differential diagnosis, um, you know, what could what could be causing this heart to be so large is, is there's a whole laundry list of things. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is a pericardial effusion, but we know by by looking at this heart um, that it's not a pericardial effusion. It's a, it's just a very large right atrium and left atrium. Uh, and without the ultrasound, it would be hard to make that, I think it would be very difficult to make that deduction. You, know, you go back to the ultrasound, you could see here that uh, the atria is just huge, and that's what's accounting for the size of this patient's heart. Okay, so under the second goal of the FATE exam is the uh, to evaluate the wall thickness and chamber dimensions, as we've been talking about, and the M mode is a nice way to do this. In fact, if we lay an M mode spike uh, right across this uh, parasternal long axis, we can see the interventricular septum here. We can see the uh, the mitral valve. We can see the um, the left ventricle, the, the posterior wall of the left ventricle here. And um, we can see the whole diameter of the left ventricle if we look closely enough. And so that's what this uh, MO tracing is, is talking about here. We can see this is the uh, interventricular septum seen here. The area above the interventricular septum, therefore, is the right ventricle. And we can see the, um, the um, dimension here of the um, left ventricle. At the uh, at the end of systole, and this is the left ventricle diameter at the end of diastole, and so we can see that the the ch the delta or the change in just this this dimension here, where the um, where the spike of the M mode tracing goes right through the heart, we can see how this changes during diastole and systole, and uh, this movement that we see here, this is all the uh, the mitral valve moving along and uh, making that tracing there. And with pulmonary embolism, as I've been alluding to, we can see that um, that the right ventricle is much larger than the left ventricle. At least it approximates the left ventricle. See, the problem is when the blood can no longer get through the vasculature bed of the lung and make it back to the left ventricle, the left ventricle gets actually um, pretty low in its uh, in its volume status, and you can easily even get kissing walls here. And so the um, the, the septum and the posterior wall are actually kissing each other. That tells us um, that uh, there's just there's no fluid there in that left ventricle, and the right ventricle is very big, and uh, and this, we can see this um, in situations like pulmonary embolism uh, or pulmonary hypertension where we see a RV strain. Big right ventricles in the case of pulmonary embolism. Now moving on to the third goal to evaluate contractility. Uh, what we're going to do here is basically do a qualitative, not a quantitative, but a qualitative judgment um, of the heart. And we can see um, that if it looks normal. Uh, hyperdynamic is when we see a lot of kissing of the, um, of the walls of the heart. Mildly reduced, moderate, or severely reduced um, contractility. And just by looking at the heart, we can, we can usually do this uh, without having to measure anything at all. So, this is a normal uh, apical four chambered view here, LV, RV, LA, RA. We can just look at the contractility. This one's moderately reduced. We see there's not as much squeeze here. There's not as much chamber size changing, you know, between systole and diastole. And finally, this is a very severely reduced um, LV contractility. We can see that there's really almost no change in the systole and, and diastole of the heart beat to beat. So again, just to kind of blow it up, this is the normal. And then we can see the um, the next one is the next slide, which shows four versions here. This is a uh, hyperkinetic heart. Again, the, the kissing walls of the heart there. This one is just mildly reduced, still has a pretty good squeeze, pretty good change uh, in chamber size between systole and diastole. This one's moderately reduced, um, not as much change going on there, and finally severely reduced, 
there's just not a lot happening there beat to beat between the um, between systole and diastole. The other way to do this is uh, in the peristernal long axis and this is where I can see that the mitral valve is seen here and it's just not making any headway up towards the interventricular septum at all. So that's one uh, factor that I use and then the second factor is the interventricular septum posterior wall. They're just not squeezing towards one another at all and so this tells me that this heart here has very poor LV function. And if we put two hearts uh, together, side, you know, across from one another, we can tell uh, that uh, indeed the the one up here is, appears quite normal. We can see good um, septal leaflet motion hit, coming up and hit, hitting the um, the anterior septal leaf of the mitral valve comes up and hits the interventricular septum, whereas down here that mitral valve is really not doing that. And finally, um, again, this interventricular septum posterior wall not happening very well down here. So this is a very poor contra this heart shows poor contractility and uh, this this heart shows normal contractility up here. Now moving on uh, to number four we want to take a look at the pleura bilaterally and uh, in this case here we can see that there's a very large um, pericardial effusion going, I'm, I'm sorry, pleural effusion going on. We have uh, the probe uh, over there in the um, uh, looking just along the diaphragm uh, laterally or coronal view of the chest and we can see as the patient's breathing in and out this is a very large pleural effusion um, we can even see loculations of pleural fluid there and if another example of that here is this is uh, the liver here and this is the kidney down here here's the diaphragm and uh, as the patient's breathing in and out we can see above the diaphragm instead of having the the mirror image artifact, we just see black fluid superior to the diaphragm, and that tells us, this black stuff here tells us that there's a fluid up there in the chest. As opposed to um, this study right here, this looks like the spleen here, this is the kidney. The spleen and the liver look very similar. Um, but this spleen, here's the diaphragm, and I see a good mirror image artifact of the spleen up in the chest. So this tells me that this chest is dry, that there's no fluid up here in the chest because of the mirror image artifact. And then finally, the fifth goal, or last goal of the FATE exam, is to relate these findings to the clinical context. And uh, this is something that you're going to you know, sort of build on as you go through the rest of your career. And, um, and one way to, uh, to think about this is that uh, even if you're doing the FATE protocol, let's say you reach number two or number three and you, and you find some process with the heart that's helping to answer your initial clinical question, um, I think it's important to complete um, the entire FATE protocol, even down to the pleura, because you never know what you're going to find. And all this data comes back uh, to you very quickly as you're doing. It only takes a, you know, a couple of minutes to get all these windows once you get good at it. And this, this information, um, you don't know how it's going to help you until later sometimes. And so it's good to go through the entire protocol, even if you've answered your first question. Uh, just one uh, one more thing I want to mention here is that um, you know which is the optimal plane to use color flow for the evaluation of the valves. I told you that you want the probe to be more parallel to the flow of the blood as it is in the apical four-chambered view. Here in the parasternal long view, it's more perpendicular to the flow of blood, and so you don't want to be perpendicular because uh, you know cosine of theta is in the Doppler equation, and cosine of 90 is zero, and you, you don't want to have a zero in any equation. So um, so that's why this, even though you know we're doing it over here, it's not ideal. It's much cleaner to do it here, looking at the aortic valve here in the apical fifth chamber view. But that's the idea. You want to um, you want to be parallel. So A is the answer. Okay, so we'll go through a couple of cases here. Case number one: a 42-year-old woman comes in with uh, H1N1 respiratory failure and severe hypoxemia. She becomes hemodynamically unstable. She's hypotensive and she's tachycardic. And the differential diagnosis of shock in this patient is, um, is multiple. Uh, there could be an obstructive problem like a pneumothorax or a PE. Um, it could be a distributive problem uh, like sepsis or um, adrenal insufficiency. Or it could be hypovolemic from hemorrhaging or other reasons to have volume depletion. And then finally, it could be the heart itself. It could be cardiogenic shock. Um, which can be caused by cardiomyopathies or other types of ischemia to the heart, uh, like a heart attack, which 
can sometimes be ischemic or there can be non-ischemic reasons to have cardiogenic shock. So first thing we do is we look at the heart. And uh, as we look at this patient's heart, um, we know the normal uh, RV to uh, LV ratio. The RV should be two-thirds the size of the LV in this case. Um, it looks like it's um, quite large. The uh, RV, in fact, is a uh, bigger than the, the LV, and so um, this suggests that the person has a, um, a, a pulmonary embolism. There's a uh, another thing going on here, which is a McConnell sign. McConnell sign is when you have um, RV lateral wall akinesis with apical sparing. So if you look over here, the apex of this heart, of the RV, you can see how it's squeezing like that. It's not akinetic, but it's actually quite kinetic. But then if you look laterally here, it's the, the RV is not making any real kinesis, no squeeze here. It's just, it's akinetic. And so, um, and, and this can be found, interestingly, in the setting of PE. And one study suggested that it was 77% sensitive and 94% specific for pulmonary embolism. Now, that can be debated from time to time, but uh, essentially, it, 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 it's something to think about. It's if, if you see this uh, lateral wall akinesis with apical sparing, mean the apex has a good squeeze to it, and the RV in this case is clearly bigger than the LV, really think about the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Now, um, if you move on with this case, and uh, we do uh, another study on this patient, um, we look down at their uh, lower extremity vasculature, and this is the um, femoral artery, this is the common femoral vein here, and as we compress, we use downward compression to try to compress the femoral vein walls together, uh, nothing happens. In fact, the femoral vein doesn't even budge, and this tells that the patient's got a deep vein thrombosis, and uh, that goes along with the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary embolism. And so in the setting of a DVT, a uh, big right ventricle with McConnell sign, we're putting it all together uh, in our differential diagnos diagnosis of shock. And, um, and one of the things to consider uh, is the use of thrombolytics like tissue plasminogen activator, which is a, basically a clot-busting drug. With uh, a, It's a dangerous drug. It's got a lot of side effects. We uh, try not to use it unless we have to, but in the setting of shock um, in a patient with, um, with a PE, it's indicated. Okay, case two. Uh, this patient's got basically unexplained hypotension. Um, it's a 65-year-old guy who comes in. He's got congestive heart failure. EF means ejection fraction. That's the way the cardiologists quantitatively assess the left ventricular um, output. And this patient, a normal ejection fraction, you know, is around 75, 80%. This patient's ejection fraction severely decreased at 30%, which is why they have congestive heart failure. And the patient also has a history of uh, Clostridium difficile colitis, which means they've been having a tremendous amount of diarrhea, getting very hypovolemic, likely from the diarrhea, and having other types of um, uh, electrolyte abnormalities that can impair cardiac motility. And so the patient came in with hypotension, uh, a mean arterial pressure of less than 60, and the patient was very dyspneic. They were breathing really hard. Now, down in the emergency department, the patient was bolus 2 liters of fluids uh, due to that severe history of diarrhea, but the patient had no improvement. And so we're sitting around scratching our heads because there's many reasons why this patient could be hypotensive. And um, even after a 2 liter fluid bolus, we still don't have any improvement. And so now we're wondering what's going on. Um, should we give more fluid? Is the patient still hypovolemic? Or is this cardiogenic shock? Is the heart itself pump failing? Or is the patient septic? And with septic shock, um, you have a whole bunch of uh, mediators that go out that I'm sure you're learning about uh, right now that can impair uh, cardiac uh, contractility. And, um, and so what we find here is uh, this is the heart. We look at the heart uh, in this view, and uh, we see that, uh, indeed, there is not very good squeeze at all, that this patient uh, in the apical four-chambered view has a pretty severely uh, decreased um, contractility. And uh, there's almost no chamber size difference here um, between the um, diastole and systole. And so then uh, we, we move on and we look at the uh, inferior vena cava. And we can see the, uh, the IVC right here as it's uh, moving in towards the, the heart, the right ventricle. Um, and in this case, uh, the, it's actually quite, uh, it's, it's, it's almost two centimeters. And there's very little change, if, if at all, in, uh, with respiration. So this tells us this patient actually has adequate uh, volume status. And then um, we go ahead and we place the transducer on the chest. You're going to learn about this one next week.
but we uh, we place the transducer on the chest and we see something called B lines. B lines are um, the basically it's when the sound gets conducted uh, through the lung. Normally, the lung doesn't have so much fluid in it, but when it's got all this uh, interstitial fluid in it, the sound gets conducted. And we get these lung rockets. These are not supposed to be there. These these comet tails extend all the way to the bottom of the screen. Um, this tells us uh, the patient is actually in pulmonary edema. Um, so uh, that's our answer is um, that the main thing is not to give this patient any more fluids because we've, that their heart cannot tolerate any more fluids. Uh, they can't, can't keep up with it. And now the fluid is being put out to the lungs, uh, which is why the patient is having so much respiratory distress. And, um, and the hypotension um, was not due to hypovolemia after all, but uh, was uh, likely due to this congestive heart failure picture, fluid overload. And you'll learn about the Starling curve and how once you get too far up the Starling curve that you can no longer, that, that, uh, that contractile function of the heart is no longer functioning well. So in fact, what we need to do is give a medication that can get rid of the fluids, um, like a diuretic, like Lasix. Okay. So that's how ultrasound is very helpful. How about this one? This patient has a hypertensive emergency. Okay, so let's take a look at this patient. Uh, this is an 80-year-old female. She's got a history of severe hypertension. She came in with rapid atrial fibrillation with pulmonary edema on examination. Now, the patient was given amio, amiodarone and, uh, and Lasix um, in the emergency department, uh, but the patient's respiratory distress just kept on worsening. And so um, this is a situation in which um, uh, we really think that the patient has uh, something going on with their heart um, because obviously we're trying medications that work on the heart like amiodarone. We're not sure what the fluid status is. We're trying to get rid of some of the fluid by giving Lasix. Uh, the, pressure, the blood pressure is really, really high. And in these situations, um, we really need to look at the heart to find out what the heck is going on. And so in this case, we can see that the patient's got a very small left ventricular chamber. In fact, the walls are coming in and uh, essentially um, kissing themselves. And um, this is what's known as a hyperdynamic uh, heart. Um, and we can also see that the, the septum of the heart is right here, and it's got a lot of uh, hypertrophy to it. We can see um, that it's definitely more than the, um, you know, the 1.2 centimeters. I don't know if you can appreciate that or not, but it's got some um, septal hypertrophy, and um, we're really worried about uh, what the next step in this patient's uh, care should be. And um, as we as we look a little bit closer at the parasternal long axis of the heart in this patient having this hypertensive uh, emergency, uh, we see the following. Now look very closely at the uh, the mitral valve. Okay, so this is the parasternal long axis. Here's the RV. Here's the LV, the left atrium. The descending aorta is seen here. You guys know all this. This is the aortic outflow tract seen here, but I want you to look very closely at that um, at that mitral valve. And this is something. Um, this is the this is the problem right here. Also, look at the septum. Look how the septum um, thickens all the way down. And actually, during systole, when the heart squeezes, the anterior septal leaf of the mitral valve flips up and makes contact with that thickened interventricular septum and it prevents the flow of blood from going past the valve and uh, and that's why this patient was having um, was basically um, about to code because the blood could no longer get through the aorta to the rest of the body and um, this patient actually needs volume if anything um, not uh, the opposite not Lasix because that'll make the situation worse and so uh, this is called uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, um, which has got many terms over the years, hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or just hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's uh, a lot of times called. But it's basically, um, we can see this systolic anterior motion, which is the SAM part, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And, uh, you know, without, <laughs> without having an echo at the bedside, there is no way we would have been able to come up with this diagnosis. And so, um, this interventricular septum, you can see it's definitely um, greater than uh, 1.2. It's more like almost 2 centimeters. And um, again, this, the, the patients in these situations, you need to control their rate. You can't have their heart go too fast. But at the same time, you need to make sure they have plenty of volume.
and um, sometimes um, what happens is you can have um, you have to differentiate this from just athletes' hearts. Somebody who does a lot of exercise, a lot of working out, that their septum can also um, thicken as well. But a normal septum, I said, is up to 1.2 centimeters. Um, with the athlete's heart, it's still going to be less than 1.5 um, centimeters. In fact, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's greater than 1.5. And um, and with athlete's heart, it's a very symmetric thickness. Whereas with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we saw that it was just the septal area that was very thick. And then um, sometimes there'll be a family history of a thickened heart. Somebody will give you some kind of an idea about that. And then if you decondition the athlete after three months, don't let them exercise, the, um, the septum goes back to normal, whereas that does not happen in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is just an example here of that. Um, this is a very thickened septum here in this parasternal long axis. We could see again over here, very thickened, asymmetrically thickened septum. The rest of the heart is not thickened, it's just the septum. That's the, that's the point I want to point out to you here. It's just this asymmetrical septal wall thickening. Okay, so just to summarize the exam, um, I think about it in terms of its eight acoustic windows, and uh, these are the acoustic windows that we're going to be getting at the hands-on session. Um, in that subcostal area, we can see the uh, view of the heart, subcostal, four-chamber view of the heart, and then with the indicator to the patient's right, we're looking at that nice subcostal view using the liver as our window, and then we rotate that indicator towards the patient's head to obtain the uh, parasagittal view of the inferior vena cava. So those are the first two views there, and then you move on to the, um, the second two views of, of the heart, which are at the apical region of the heart, the apex, and we've got an apical four-chamber, which we're familiar with from last year, and this year the apical two chamber, we're adding on to it, rotating the uh, indicator um, counterclockwise towards the floor. And then along the, um, the parasternal axis, we've got the parasternal long, which in the indicator is the patient's left hip, and then the parasternal right, we have the indicator of the patient's right hip. Uh, I'm sure the parasternal short is where the indicator is the patient's right hip. And then finally, views seven and eight, we're looking at the pleura for any evidence of fluid up in the chest. The lack of the mirror image artifact confirms the fluid in the chest. All right, thank you very much.